and don't let's not curse for the next few minutes because I think the people are on. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm just kidding. I know you're on. Um, so today is a very exciting day. It's almost the two-year anniversary of Ryan Deesom and I's first webinar, which was two hours and 15 minutes long. Don't worry, we're both two years older. We don't have the endurance for that today. Um, we're going to do an hour and a half. So let me tell you, in keeping with our theme of A-listers only, Ryan is singular in the field of pulmonary wellness and rehabilitation in the sense that Ryan is the person who I consider to be the most knowledgeable about anything related to portable oxygen concentrators. Um, Ryan is the author of the pulmonary paper, shout out Celeste, um, the pulmonary paper's guide to pulmonary oxygen concentrators, portable oxygen concentrators, annual review. And that means he's not somebody who's heard about them, not somebody who's read about them, he and his Valley Inspired products have used them, tested them, uh, and probably know them better than anybody else. So this is going to be a great opportunity for him to teach us and for us to learn and for you to also ask questions. Um, Ryan was the research manager at Valley Inspired Products. He has over 15 years of experience in the respiratory field, testing and evaluated, evaluating home respiratory equipment, in including oxygen systems home ventilators, CPAPs, interfaces, and more. He's been a regular contributor to the pulmonary paper since 2010, offering educational information and informed advice to home oxygen users on their systems and capabilities. He's been a frequent presenter at local support groups and over the years has presented at multiple conferences and webinars. He is currently in the process of acquiring his RRT certification with an estimated completion this summer. He lives in St. Paul, Minnesota, has two cats and a large record collection. Maybe he'll play some today and en enjoys going to live concerts. And I found out today is also an expert on professional wrestling. So welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me again. I must have done something right the first time. So <laughs> you, you, you did. You did something amazing. So if you could just start us off, Ryan, why do people need oxygen? And who are the people that need oxygen and why? That's the same. <clears throat> well, so basically, you know, their gas, gas exchange is in, uh, impaired. So when you breathe in the oxygen, there's 21% oxygen in the air around us. When you breathe it in, it goes into your lungs and then it goes into your bloodstream. Whatever your disease process is, uh, that, that process is impaired. So there isn't as much oxygen getting into your bloodstream uh, that is for, you know, a, a typical healthy person. So that's where supplemental oxygen comes in. So you increase the percentage of oxygen that's in the air. So instead of 21%, it might be 28% or 40%. Um, and you know, that's gonna vary depending on your device and all your breath rates and stuff. And that's why this is a very inexact science. Um, so when you increase that percentage of oxygen in the air, the idea is hopefully more of that will get into your bloodstream uh, to kind of keep your, your blood oxygenation up. So that can get to the tissues that need that oxygen to uh, to perform. Brian, when would somebody know that they need oxygen, or what's the process that most people um, go through to say, "I need oxygen. This is what I need. How do I get it?" Well, first, I mean, you know, if if you're early on in your disease state, it might be you know you're short of breath. Um, you know, you notice you go out to your mailbox, or if you go out exercising, you're becoming more short of breath more often. Uh, and that gets you kind of start thinking, you know, what's going on here? And you go in uh, and you say, hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm short of breath. Um, and your physician, doctor, you know, might say, well, let's, uh, you know, let's do some tests on you, see what your oxygenation is at. And um, currently, right now, um, you know, the kind of standard is if you drop below 88%, you know, typically people are between 92 and 98% on their, their blood oxygen. And when that drops below 88%, that's kind of a, a warning sign that there's something going on and your gas exchange is impaired. So, um, you know, lots of times people end up doing a six minute walk test, you know, which is they, they have you walk down the hall or whatever, walk around for six minutes and see if your, your oxygenation does drop below 88%. And then they'll put on oxygen and see if that keeps you above 88%. And if that does, then that, that's a, a good indication that, you know, supplemental oxygen is going to help you. So, at that point, you, you, you get prescribed oxygen. 
and hopefully it's at a, you know, at a certain leader flow that, that meets those needs. But one of the limitations of the six minute walk test is, you know, typically you're just walking around on a flat surface. You know, you're not walking on an incline more, more often than not, you know, I liken it to, you know, if you're at home and you have, you know, some stairs or whatever, it's not the same as walking up the stairs in your home. It's not the same as going out and doing some gardening. You know, those activities are a little different than just walking around on a flat surface. So those six minute walk tests are kind of limited in, in how much they actually evaluate, uh, you know, whether or not you need oxygen. So in some cases, there might be people that do well on the six minute walk test, but they still, you know, remain short of breath. And there, you know, there may be a disease process present there. So, you know, it may take a little bit, a little bit longer for that, you know, that to show up in the six minute walk test. So, you know, I encourage people to be, be persistent, you know, if, if they're feeling short of breath and say, hey, something's going on here. And, you know, we need to, you know, we need to look into it. Ryan, can you explain why 88% is such a significant number or why Medicare uh, won't allow you oxygen unless you hit 88%? Sure. There, there's this thing called the oxygen hemoglobin, hemoglobin disassociation curve. And it, it basically, the hemoglobin that's in your blood, that's what attaches the oxygen and, and allows it to travel through your bloodstream. So <clears throat> at, at 88% and above, the affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen that allows it to attach the blood is really good. 88 is kind of that, that level where if it gets below that, the, the, the affinity that that hemoglobin has really significantly drops off. You know, and you, you can kind of liken it to being on a hill and sledding. Whereas if you're at the top of the hill and you kind of, you know, and say the top of the hill is like 96, you know, and there is a slight incline, 94, 92, you don't really have a lot of momentum and you get down to 90. But once you get to 88, you know, all of a sudden you have a lot of momentum and it's a lot easier for that hemoglobin uh, to, to lose the ability to pick up oxygen once you get below that 88%. So that number is kind of important uh, when we're talking about, uh, you know, whether you need oxygen or not. Because once you get below that, it's really hard to stop that motivation or, uh, uh, momentum and, and keep your SATs above that level. So that's why it's kind of important, you know, keep your levels above that, you know, above 88. And, you know, most cases people say try and keep it above 90 or 92. Um, you know, that way you're not close to that kind of threshold. Uh, so the supplemental oxygen will help you do that to keep you above that. Um, Ryan, I think this is a good time. Can you just talk a little bit about, um, so one of the things we recommend is that people get their own pulse oximeters, that people yep. monitor themselves and get used to kind of being able to self-regulate. Can you talk a little yep. bit about the variation um, in oximeters? Because that's something that comes up a lot. And I've heard people say, oh, they're all the same. Uh, I personally don't think they're all the same, um, but can, I know you know a lot of, can you just talk about the variation in that? Sure. Uh, from, from the testing that we've done over the years, kind of what I've, I've come to conclude is you get what you pay for with a, with a pulse oximeter. Um, the, the more inexpensive ones, the ones you might get on Amazon or at Walgreens for, you know, 25, 30 bucks, even $50, uh, most of those are made by one or two companies in China and they just have different labels and, and, and different names uh, attached to them. They may look different too. So it does appear that they're all, they're all different. Um, but there really isn't a whole, whole lot of manufacturers of, of pulse oximetry equipment. And the, the testing that we've done has shown they're pretty good at tracking oxygenation when you are above, you know, 88%. When you're in kind of that healthy range, you know, most of them do really well. It's when you start to DSAT and you start seeing some of those DSATs that you really see uh, the differences in quality of these devices. So, you know, somebody might be wearing one and drop down to 80%. Well, the response time on that pulse oximeter might be pretty slow. So you could be at 80% for, you know, two minutes before, you know, it even starts to register that, you know, there is a sat saturation drop there. Um, you know, there are, there are companies here in the States, you know, not in, um, they put one out, you know, if, if I recommend one, it's, it's typically the non and go to that's about $100. You can find it on Amazon. Um, you know, the results that we've seen on that one were pretty good and, and pretty good at tracking, you know, below, uh, below 88. So, you know, there are differences. Um, and, you, you know, again, you might not see them when they're you're kind of in that healthy, 
healthy oxygenation range. Uh, but once you start, you know, exercising and moving around, um, they have a, a lot more difficult time tracking. You know, when you're exercising, you're, you're moving around and you're doing stuff. So that can affect how well, well the device is tracking. It might not be able to get a signal very well. So it's not going to respond until it can pick up another signal. Um, so, you know, you might not see any, any sort of saturation change, even though there actually is. Um, so, like I said, I kind of, you know, the, the cheaper ones typically are the ones that are made in China, which is not a surprise. Um, you know, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. It's just the quality of material that's in them isn't quite as good as the ones that are made over here um, and, you know, are obviously going to cost a little bit more. So, Ryan, you mentioned the, the movement aspect of it, but it, it sounds like what you're saying is that as people desaturate and become more hypoxic, the machines become less accurate. Is that yeah. even at rest? What was that last part? Is that even at rest? Uh, at rest, it, you know, again, it kind of comes down to tracking. At rest, it probably has a better, better chance of picking up your signal, but at rest, you're probably going to be you know, in, in a healthier oxygenation range. If at rest you're at 70, you know, 70%, hopefully you're not, but you know, if you're at 70 or 80%, you know, it might not be tracking that very well. Um, you know, it is kind of the higher saturations that, you know, again, most of them do pretty good. It's when you get into the, the lower levels that you want to really want to know what, you know, how accurate your saturation is uh, that you see some of those differences. You know, that's such a great point, and I, I think it kind of disputes the argument that they're all the same. Um, yep. I remember last time, like, you threw up a gang signal with four different oximeters on your fingers, and a lot of times people will show as evidence that they're the same, their pulse oximeters. But it's like saying, like, okay, well, you know, you, the, the pilot's vision will be great until we get within a 1,000 feet of the ground. I mean, that's the time where you need the most important information um, the other thing is, you know, price is something that I know a lot of people are um, cognizant of, and it's sometimes, you know, the, the, the factor that, that, you know, causes people to choose one thing or another. But in this case, it sounds like, you know, it, it's, it's really, it could make, um, it can make a huge difference in knowing the correct um, amount. So for $100, yeah, it's not, it's not cheap, but like you wouldn't skimp on a life jacket. Same mm -hmm. kind of thing here. Agreed. Agreed. An another thing that you mentioned last time was you were talking about how, um, like, at the at the lower um, at the lower numbers, like there are some oximeters that won't even register down low. Like, you, I, I think you you spoke of so a time where you tested one, and regardless of what you did, it never went below eighty five. Yep. Yep. So there's yep. So there's this device out there that you know kind of. Uh, simulates a finger probe basically so we tested a whole bunch of oximeters on on that device and there was one that we put it on there and we had it drop down to 82 and then to 75 and then come back up and it didn't drop below i want to say 93 or 94 during that entire time it was about a 15 minute kind of trial period so you know that was an example of one oximeter not uh not responding appropriately um you know we can guess on, you know, was it, uh, you know, was it the quality of the device or, you know, was it something about you know, even the, the uh, simulated fingertip probe that we had that, you know, wasn't reading very well, um, you know, so you can kind of question, you know, what was going on there. But, you know, from our perspective, it was like nothing happened. So it's like, I, I would not feel comfortable, you know, saying that that's a device that, you know, I would want to use on somebody or have somebody use. You know, it, it reminds me, and I think I told you this last time, but I was once at Marion Maclis's house, and she has a thermometer hanging on her wall, and someone brought it from, for, from China for her. No, no, you know, I don't know if that's a coincidence or not, but it was a Mao Tse Tung thermometer. And when I looked at it closely, it didn't have any mercury in it, but it was always at 82. It was always at 82. It was always perfect, right? Yeah. It was always perfect. So I think it's Amazing. the same kind of thing. Um, we have a question from the audience at home. Uh, it's from Nancy. It says, I can't get a reading from a pulse oximeter on my fingers because I have scleroderma. I can't find an ear probe for anything like a reasonable price. Any suggestions? Yeah, that's tough. And I, I wish I had a good answer for you, um, but I don't. Um, you know, the, the, once you get 
beyond the, the fingertip probes, you know, which are more, you know, commercially available, you start getting into those more expensive ones that get into the two, $300 range, if not even more than that, you know, with the ear probes or sometimes, you know, you have the forehead probes, um, you know, that's not something that we've really tested a whole lot. Um, you know, those are usually pretty good. So, um, you know, that's, that's a tough, you know, tough situation to be in when, you know, the, the finger probes don't really work for you for, you know, perfusion reasons or, or whatever. Um, you know, I, again, I wish I had an answer for you, but I, I don't right now. Uh, it's something I can look into. Have you tested any of the uh, Massimos that, are, that work with the smartphones? Uh, not, not specifically the ones that work with the smartphones, but Massimo is pretty good too. You know, every time we've, we've evaluated those, you know, haven't really had any issues. So, you know, I would expect the, you know, the technology in, in the sensors and whatever is all the same. It's just how it connects to the phone. Um, so, you know, if it's a Bluetooth connection or whatever, you know, all that is, is reporting the data that the, the, the probe itself is, is sending. So, you know, I would expect the technology in the probe to be the same as their other, you know, their other technology. Um, so it's just, it's just a way to display it. Gotcha. Nancy, one of the things we use at the center is we'll use those, um, self-heating hand warmers. Um, you know, those, those tend to help get a little more circulation to the hand so you could get a better reading. You could try that. They're cheap. Um, and Lorene asked, Ryan, how do you spell the name of the oximeter that costs around a hundred? Are we talking about the Nonin? Yep. N O N I N. Go to G O two. Gotcha. Um, can you talk a little bit about testing procedure for the six minute walk? Cause that's something also that I, I hear a wide degree of variability about. So yeah, they'll have, you know, they'll either have a finger probe or an ear probe or whatever <clears throat> attached to you. Um, they'll have you get up and, and basically just walk down the hall. So they're tracking, they're tracking your saturation as you're walking down the hall and again, you know, these are, you know, these are higher quality devices than your typical, you know, finger probes, again, that you can find at Walgreens. You know, they're, they're not usually, at least I haven't seen them usually be those type of devices. So they have you walk and, you know, the idea is that they're tracking your, your saturations in real time. And, you know, if you drop below 88%, you know, they'll, they'll stop you and say, all right, you know, this is an indication that, you know, you need oxygen at activity at least. So we will stop and then we will put on a liter full. So you'll put on a cannula and wear, you know, wear some oxygen, you know, often at one or two liters a minute. Um, and then have you do that walk again and see to see if that keeps you above 88 during that six minutes. Um, you know, I, I have seen it where uh, in the hospital, you know, some, some places do it a little differently each time. So that is, you know, that is one of the issues. There isn't always consistency between how each, uh, each facility is testing. The idea is, you know, you do the walk test, but, you know, the, the way they administer it might be a little, little different between each one. So there may be some of you out there that don't, you know, don't have similar stories to each other. So. A lot of times people will report that somebody will check their saturation before exercise and then after exercise and then not during exercise. Can you talk a little bit about how reflective that might be of what's going on during the actual workout? Well, I mean, there are people that as soon as they get up, they desat, you know, as soon as they do any movement. So if you're looking at yourself while you're sitting there and then, you know, take the probe off and go, go do something and then come back and sit down, you know, the, re you know, recovery period, you know, can be pretty quick too. So, you know, if you're not tracking yourself during that time, you know, you might not really have a good indication of, you know, how, how low your blood oxygenation is getting. Um, you know, I, when I talk to people, I certainly recommend that they, they kind of watch their axiometry whenever, you know, whatever activity that they're doing. And if at all possible, you know, write that down. You are going to be the best, you know, best, uh, basically the best person to know how well you're doing on oxygen at any given time. And the more, the more information you take for yourself, the more valuable that's going to be for you and anybody who might be treating you, your pulmonologist or your physician or whoever, um, to say, Hey, you know, here's, here's my situation when I'm doing these activities, you know, it's not the same as, you know, walking around the house or whatever. Um, so, you know, the more information you, you have, you know, the better idea you have of, you know, what, what, how much oxygen you might need in, in certain situations. You know, you might not need oxygen in some situations at all. 
And that's good, especially if you're on a portable system or whatever, where you know, you're either limited by how much content you have, gas content, or how much battery life you have. So you know, if you can be out and about, and then instead of being on you know, three liters a minute, you can have it be at one, you know, that's either going to save some of your content or save some of your battery life. Um, if you don't need it at all, then you can turn it off. You know, so instead of needing to be on it the entire time, um, you know, you can kind of adjust as you go. You know, one of my biggest concerns when it comes to oxygen prescription is that patients are kind of given this arbitrary two liters per minute at rest, four liters per minute with exercise. And it's, it's like a rule. Um, and we all know that that's not, you know, that's not always correct. Yeah. Um, one of the best descriptions I've, I've actually the best description I've ever heard about how you should be using your oxygen is by Dr. Norma Braun. And she says, like, if the room is chilly, you put on a sweater. And if it warms up, you take the sweater off again. Um, but I think too often, patients are not afforded that liberty by their healthcare providers. Or yeah, there, there are some out there who, you know, adamantly say, don't change your setting. Don't change your setting. Whatever you do, don't change your setting. And, you know, personally, I disagree with that. It's like, you, if you are tracking yourself and you know that you need oxygen, if you're at 88, you know, if you're below 88, why would you not give yourself more oxygen to keep, keep you above that? You know, some of you, uh, you know, some of the excuses might be, well, you don't want to give yourself too much oxygen, you know, and that, you know, there is some truth to that. If you're at, you know, 96% when you're at rest and you put on oxygen at two liters a minute, and then you just keep that on all day and you're at, you know, 99, 100 for a long time. You know, yeah, maybe something could happen, but, you know, they call it hypoxic drive where you get too much oxygen. So you're kind of, your body says, all right, I don't need to, to respirate as much. So I'm not going to, um, that's kind of where the concern comes, comes from, but that's not going to happen when you are desatting. when you're at 87, 86, 85, you're not at risk of, you know, losing your hypoxic drive. You are going to increase your need, increase your rate to respond to that, to get your blood oxygenation back up. So Give yourself, you know, some more oxygen to keep yourself above that level. You know, I, you know, that's one thing that I hear a lot is, you know, that that people who particularly are CO2 retainers, um, you know, they're afraid that they're, you're going to shut their hypoxic drive. You know, I, and that that is true for for COPD patients, especially th those types that are the CO2 retainers. You know, their saturations are more often, you know, between 88 and, and 92. You know, 92 if they're lucky quite often. So there is, you know, there is genuine concern there that you don't want to do that. If you're, if your kind of baseline saturation is between 88 and 92%, then yeah, you don't really want to keep it above that for any super length of time. Um, again, but it would take a while to get to that point. So um, the, the typical concentrators or the typical devices that people have have the ability to do that? I mean, they're, to, they're, I mean, to they're, so many of them are giving such minuscule amounts of oxygen anyway. I mean, I, you know, Correct. in my experience, I mean, I've been doing what I do for 27 years plus another, you know, 17 as an as a EMT. I've never, I, you know, and every time I say this, there's somebody who calls in or, or, or sends me a letter that says, you know what, I wound up in the hospital because I had too much oxygen. I've never seen anyone get in trouble for too much. I've only seen people get in trouble for too little. Um, that's my yeah. Advice. I mean, more often than not, it's like you need to be on 100% oxygen for a significant length of time for something to happen. Any of your, your, your supplemental oxygen devices, you don't have a mask on that's delivering 100% oxygen. Through a cannula, you'll, you'll get anywhere, depending on what your flow rate is, you'll get anywhere from, you know, 21, if you, you know, well, I guess 24, 24% to, you know, 50, 50, 55% or so. Um, and then if you get to the higher, you know, if you're on a higher flow system, you know, that maybe goes up to 15, even then you're not on 100% oxygen. So, you know, there's no real situation where it's like you're on a, you know, unless you're in a hospital critical situation with a non-rebreather, you know, 100%, you know, percent oxygen mask on, you know, uh, most of the time the, the situations aren't, aren't, aren't similar at all. And, and usually those people are in dire straits anyway. At that point, yes. I've certainly seen people get in trouble wearing oxygen, but it wasn't, the oxygen that got them in trouble, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's usually some other underlying issue that is that is causing the current situation.
can, can, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions uh, from the audience uh, from Mendo. I thought they weren't supposed to stop you during a six minute walk test, even if you dropped. Yeah, like I said, some places, you know, some places do it differently. I've seen it where they, you know, they stop somebody because they just don't want you to be below 88%. Maybe it's possible that, you know, there was some study going on and, you know, it was, you know, some IRB agreement or something. But yeah, you know, ideally you go through the six minutes to see how, how low you desaturate. But I've seen it where, you know, they have been stopped uh, during the test because they didn't want them, you know, they didn't want them to desaturate any further. I think also sometimes clinicians get nervous, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. You, know, you have a patient with ILD where the saturation plummets and the person looks horrible. They're breathing 40 or 50 breaths per minute. Um, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, one of the things is, you know, that, that is said is look at the patient. You know, that's, that's the first thing you do. Look at the patient. If you have any, you know, concerns or whatever, look at the patient. And if you don't feel as comfortable, you stop. You know, you don't, you don't keep doing what you're doing uh, and, and find something else. So, you know, like you're saying, a lot of people will be like, all right, you know, you're desatting, you're really short of breath. You know, you know, we don't want you to pass out on the floor right here. So we're going to stop the test. You know what we do, we don't use the six minute walk test unless we're, you know, occasionally we'll be asked as a, a favor to do it for a doctor or something like that. But the reason why we stopped it is because it, it's, it's so variable. And it's so patient, you know, I feel it's too patient controlled, number one. Um, so what I mean by that is before the patients write me nasty letters is that, you know, you have the ability to go as fast as you want. You can also go as slow as you want. You could stop if you want. Okay. And that doesn't always lead to the best data collection. Yep. Um, yep. And the other thing is, like I said, if you have a nervous clinician, um, they will tell you stop, catch your breath. Um, what we do, we'll let people go to 80%. And that sounds really low. But the reason why I, I do it, and I, I feel comfortable with that is because if that's what's happening during your six minute walk test, you'd have to be a fool to believe that that's not also happening at other times during the day. Yep. Um, so I feel, you know, data is always valuable. And the more information we have, the better. Now, of course, you're right. We don't want our patient turning blue and, and hitting the deck. But again, the idea is that six minute walk test usually won't do more to them than their everyday lives. And then we get the information. Um, that's, that's been my policy for, you know, a while. We've never, we've never had a problem with it. Thank God. Um, but again, sometimes, you know, I, I'm sure some people have had the experience where they need oxygen, right? But they go to a testing facility and they can't get them to desaturate. That's a problem too, because then Medicare says we, you don't qualify for oxygen, you know, so then yep. it's going to catch 22. Yeah, you know, and, you know, there could be daily variances. You could take a six minute walk test on one day and be just fine and then take it the next day and not be, you know, so the more data there is, the better. And, you know, the, we're making some of these decisions based on very limited data. And, you know, that's not always beneficial, certainly not always beneficial for the person that needs, you know, this information. That's where the patient education really comes in handy, you know, and, and, and so many times, you know, with, I've had patients go back to their own physicians and say, hey, you know what, I heard this, what do you think of that? And if you can make a logical argument, the physician more often than not will say yes. Yeah, agreed. You know, one of the, one of the message I try and send out is, you know, be your own advocate. Um, a lot of times the people that you are interacting with uh, aren't going to know as much as you do. The more you educate yourself, you know, on, on what your needs are and, you know, what your daily life is like and, you know, what your concerns are, um, you know, and you can bring that to the people that are, that are trying to help you, um, you know, a lot of times they, they won't know that information. So, you know, we were talking before, uh, you know, before the uh, call here started about how <clears throat> doctors don't, you know, they'll prescribe oxygen, but they don't know any of the devices, you know, in a hospital, you know, you have the oxygen on the wall, it's just there all the time. You know, you might have some tanks that have regulators on it or whatever, but the equipment that is used in the hospital is very limited. And a lot of times the, the physicians that are making some of these prescriptions, they don't know all the variability that are in the products that, you know, people are going to actually be using at home. So they don't, they don't understand any of that stuff. You know, and it's, it's just, you know, it's a lack of education. You know, it's not necessarily their fault or anything. It's just, it's just kind of how it is. So, 
the more you know about your, your condition and your needs, and the more you can share with the, the people that are treating you, you know, the, the better healthcare hopefully you will receive. So be your own advocate, you know. I think a lot of people also take the, make the assumption that like, well, if they're selling it, it must work. Yeah, and that, you know, if they are selling it, it does work, you know, to an extent. It just might not be appropriate for certain people in certain situations, you know. You know, you can look at the, the POC guide that we do and say, all right, you know, this isn't a good device. Well, no, that's not true. It's a good device for the person that can use it. You know, it just not, may not be a lot of people that can use it, you know. So it's not that none of these work. You know, they've obviously passed, you know, passed, you know, standards and whatever. And we've tested most of them. They all, for the most part, they all work, you know, work to whatever, you know, their specifications are supposed to be. It's just a lot of times those specifications don't really meet the needs of the larger population. Exactly. Exactly. Good point. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between the different types of oxygen that are available to people? So the concentrators versus tanks versus liquid. Sure. So, you know, m the most common, you know, that you see, you know, is, is the tanks, you know, maybe not so much more these days, but, you know, in the, the 80s, 90s, you know, tanks were kind of thing and you'd have a regulator on it that would just deliver a, you know, kind of continuous flow. You could set it to one to six or some of the high flow ones, you know, but those limitations are you have a tank, you know, one is heavy and two, there's limited content. So, you know, the higher your flow rate, the faster you go through that content. You know, the stationary, stationary concentrators, when they came in, they were nice, but they were able to generate oxygen. And how those work is they take out, you know, they take out room air and just bring it in and compress it. And then they separate the oxygen from the rest of the nitrogen and, uh, you know, other trace gases that are, in, that are in the air. So it can deliver you the oxygen while purging the rest of those gases out just back into the room. So it just goes back into the room air. So you get that higher purity oxygen from the concentrator. And those are just continuously running. So it was nice. You're not limited by the tanks. You are limited by whether or not you have an electrical power source. So, you know, that's where the concern comes in during, you know, storms or whatever, where you lose power. And most people should have, you know, a tank or two at their house in case, you know, their, their stationary concentrator fails. So there, there's at least a backup system there. And then you get into the portable concentrators and kind of the, the conserving regulators um, that started, all right, we're wasting all of this oxygen that isn't being inhaled, uh, you know, continuous flow oxygen is always running. So when you're exhaling, none of that oxygen is useful. It's just going out into the air. Um, so the idea behind pulse devices, conserving regulators, and you know, these portable concentrators that are delivering pulse, uh, pulses is that we're only gonna give oxygen when you know, the person is actually inhaling. And so the, the issue with those is they all deliver that differently. Some have higher peak flows, some deliver it for a longer period of time. And your breath rate and your breath pattern can kind of affect how much oxygen you get from those pulse devices. And that's why we say, you know, a two on one device is not a two on another is not a two on another. If you have a continuous flow device, you know, two liters a minute is two liters a minute, assuming the device is working appropriately. And, you know, unless you have a reason to think otherwise, you know, it's, you know, it should be two. If you see two liters on your little, on your little ball dial, on your concentrator, you know, you should be getting two liters a minute. But these pulse devices, you might have some variability between the pulse volumes from, you know, as low as 12 up to 24 or 26, even 28. So, you know, that's quite a bit of volume differential between each breath. So, you know, the one that's delivering 12 probably isn't going to oxygenate at that two setting as well as the one that is set to two and is delivering 28 milliliters, you know, per breath. So there's a lot of variability in these pulse devices and, you know, when those started coming out, the, the conserving regulators came out in the 80s, the 90s, and then we got into the, the, the portable concentrators. Um, the variability that those kind of brought um, to, uh, you know, to home care and, and whatever is that, you know, people kind of lost some understanding of what was going on because there was just so many devices. Between 2005 and 2009 or so, I think there was 13 or 14 portable concentrators introduced in the market and they all did different things, you know, and that's kind of where we came in and said, all right, what are these doing and how, you know, how is it impacting, you know, how is it impacting the patient? Um, and so that's why we were trying to educate, educate people on that and say, Hey, you know, it might not be your disease. It might be a, a misapplication of a device. Maybe you need something that can deliver more oxygen. And unfortunately with portable concentrators, that usually means if you need more oxygen, you need a bigger device. 
you know, everybody wants the smallest, lightest, longest lasting device. And ideally we would have that, but you know, technology, we, the, where it's at right now, we just don't have that. So in order, in order to generate enough oxygen, the device needs to be bigger in, in those cases. So, and you know, we can, we haven't talked about liquid oxygen yet. Liquid oxygen is the longest, longest lasting, lightest oxygen system that is out there. Um, and unfortunately, because of, you know, economics, uh, we're not really seeing, you know, liquid oxygen being used as much. People have had it taken away from them, which is incredibly unfortunate. You know, especially the high flow users where the portable concentrators and, um, <clears throat> you know, the, even the kind of standard conserving regulators just can't meet those needs. You know, liquid would be best for them and it would be lightest and it would allow them to be a lot more active than, than a tank, you know, carrying around a tank or you know, be homebound because they don't have uh, the, the appropriate portable system to be able to go out and do the activities that they want to do. You know, there's a, a saying in construction and they say that when people want a job done, they want three things. They want it done well, they want it done fast, and they want it done cheap. Yep. And they say you can have any two of the three. And it's very similar in, in oxygen. It's like everybody wants the same three things. They want something that's light, they want something that gives a lot of oxygen and they want something that's going to last a long time. And the theory is the same. You could have any two out of the three. Um, you know, I know of a couple of colleges now that are, are having contests, like some technical institutes and things like that, to try to come up with a novel way of, um, you know, providing this oxygen. But we're, what we're really talking about is splitting the atom. You know what I mean? Everyone's like, mm -hmm. well, you know, they should, they should do this. Yeah, of course we should, but it's, it's really, it's not a simple thing to do. And the sad part is, as you mentioned, liquid oxygen could be the answer for so many people. And instead of making it more available, it's becoming less available. Yep. And that's, you know, that's because of the costs associated with providing it. Your home care providers, you know, if you, if you are a person that needs liquid, they need to cut, you know, the liquid evaporates over time. So if you don't use it, it still goes away. So there's always a service cost associated with somebody having, having to have somebody deliver that oxygen, fill up the tank, um, do any sort of maintenance and that type of thing on it, uh, and do that you know, at least once a month, if not twice a month. So the costs associated with delivering and providing liquid are more than any of these other modalities that, that we talked about. And that's why it was kind of the first thing to go when the, the Medicare uh, competitive bid program you know, came in, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, whatever it is now. So, uh, you know, this year they did kind of up the payment on liquid again, uh, which was good. It was kind of a, a, a acknowledgement that, you know, it didn't quite work, but I don't know that it was enough. And I, I still don't think we're going to see, uh, you know, any significant changes there, but at least that was a, a turnaround in the right direction. And hopefully going forward, you know, the, the more we can kind of educate educate people on what's going on, on there that we can get liquid, you know, more available, you know, in the, in the, in the late nineties and early two thousands, you know, there was lots of people that had liquid. Um, and I, I really don't see, you know, other than the cost, you know, I really don't see a reason why, why we should have gone away from that. To me, it's not, you know, it's, it's not therapeutic. You know, the, the, the patients are the ones that have suffered, you know, all, all in the uh, name of money, you know, so, which is, you know, not surprising, unfortunately, but, um, you know, we took, we took several steps backwards. You know what the sad part of that is also is that, um, you know, in that time that they cut all these rates, so many of these companies went out of business. Yep. Um, the same exact thing with pulmonary rehab, which is that they cut the rate in, ha in, in almost more than half. And in New York city, we went from five rehab centers to three. Yep. So hospital centers closed because they couldn't make it work. Um, but that's where advocacy comes in. You know, that's yep. where us getting involved and patients getting involved and saying, look, if I'm, if, you know, and, and letting your Congress people know that, you know, it's just not a cost cutting measure. It's a lifestyle issue. And that those changes, you know, there's other places you could cut costs where it doesn't change too much. You know what I mean? But if you don't have enough oxygen to leave your house, well, that's significant, you know? Yeah, like, exactly. You know, um, you know, or you're always worried about things, you know, running out of oxygen. I mean, there's probably few fears, you know, that are more, that are, that are greater than that. I mean, I know, I know what it feels like because I, I'm a scuba diver. So it's like, you know, you're only as good as, as your tank, 
you're only as good as your regulator. And, you know, if, if you, if you think you're running low or, you know, you're having a difficulty with the, with the, the machinery, it's, it's terrifying. Um, one thing before we go on people, if you would like to ask questions, you are welcome to unmute yourself so we can hear your voice. Um, we like hearing your voices. We actually, Ryan and Ryan has a fear of minds. So he actually doesn't want to, um, he, he prefers the talking. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. I'm gonna go to the mimes that have typed in, what happens when I sleep with oxygen but only have some periods of time during sleep, I actually need the extra oxygen. Will I get too much during the night? By the way, I don't have COPD, I have ILD. Okay. Yeah, again, you know, you're not you're not being delivered a hundred percent oxygen in, in that in, in that situation. Um, you know, I don't know if you have overnight oximetry capability, but it might be worth looking to see if you do have that. Um, you know, I I'm guessing you've had a, a sleep test to kind of determine that you did need oxygen at night. Um, you know, again, what what it comes down to is you're not being delivered a hundred percent oxygen for a really long time. Um, I, I really wouldn't have any concern with that uh, whatsoever. Kathy, I'm unmuting you. Have okay, you had a sleep study? I Hello. Um, hi. I did have a sleep study, and um, they determined that I go down to something enough times to warrant like two liters a night, and that's all they told me, and that's all I've done, and so that's what I do. Did they rule out? So did they rule out like apnea? Are you on? No. So are you're not on any CPAP, you're just on oxygen? Right. Okay. Hmm. They only did the overnight test where they measure my oxygen on my finger and that's it. Right. You didn't have a sleep study. Yeah. No. So so it was just the finger. It wasn't you didn't have the, the thing that kind of went around your chest? Right, just the finger. Are you tired at all during the day? Like my, my first question would be to you, like, you know, is is there a chance you do have some sort of apnea. So what, what happens in, in sleep, if you have obstructive apnea or even central apnea, but you know, typically the home tests that are out there, they will have the finger probe, but then they'll have also a belt that, that measures your breathing. So you know, your chest movement can tell, uh, and then they'll have the cannula in the nose that's also measuring your flow. So if your chest is moving and there's no flow coming out of here, that's indicative of an obstructive ap apnea. And lots of people desat during that because you're, you know, your chest is moving, but you're not, there's no flow going anywhere because there's something in your airway that is blocking that from going. So you will see desats happen. So, you know, you desat it. So they said, all right, we'll give you oxygen. I'm surprised, I guess, that they didn't try a sleep test or, you know, just one of the home sleep screeners to see, hey, could this be from some sort of obstructive event that is happening during the night or even a, you know, a central event. So what a central event is, it's just kind of your brain says, all right, we're not going to breathe for this short amount of time. And they can differentiate that because your chest also stops moving. So there's no flow, but your chest isn't moving either. Um, you know, that doesn't happen nearly as often as, as obstructive apnea does. Um, so yeah, that, you know, that is kind of odd to me that they would just do that based on just the finger, you know, finger probe test and not like the actual uh, home sleep screener test to see you know, if there's a chance that you had, you know, an obstructive apnea event that is causing your desatch, you know, desats. Maybe there's something else with your, your history or whatever that, you know, has already ruled that out. I don't it's know, just but. been an odd journey altogether. So. Okay. So I, I would suggest, I would suggest looking into that. Right. If that's, you know, if that's something that interests you um, or, you know, concerns you, uh, uh, look into that. Okay. Thanks. So I'm going to tell you my opinion is that I have pretty much zero concern about somebody with restrictive or interstitial lung disease getting too much oxygen. Okay. Because it's not the same mechanism that somebody with COPD has for getting, you know, so back to, you know, a little bit, just a moment of what we talked about before with the hypoxic drive. So just to, you know, to make it really clear, like people with COPD often retain too much CO2, too much carbon dioxide, right? Why? Because there's an obstructive disease, right? So with obstructive disease, you have difficulty blowing air out and you wind up with these, you know, increased levels of carbon dioxide, which are determined mm -hmm. by a blood gas. Now, mm -hmm. the thing is that normally pH will control your respiration 
and a rise in, in, in CO2 will control your respiration. So the thinking of hypoxic drive theory is that if your CO2 is chronically high, meaning like if I were to do this in your eye, like all day, every day, it would be annoying at first, but eventually you'd adapt to it. So they say like people with, um, with, with high levels of CO2 all the time shift their metabolism so that they now breathe in response to hypoxia, meaning mm. low oxygen. So the thinking is that if we give you that oxygen, we suppress the drive to breathe and you stop breathing. It's like a shark, we stop swimming, okay? Mm. The theory has been debunked many, many times. Most people mm. don't believe it. If you wanna really have some fun, throw that out to Mark Mangus and, and, and that'll get him going a bit. Um, but the idea is, if Mark's here, Mark, go for it. Um, but the idea is that the only, only time, and I can't say that I am a thousand percent sure that it can't possibly happen to anybody. The person I would worry about is the COPD patient who is a known CO2 retainer during sleep. That's the person I would worry about getting too much oxygen. Like we use at our center, even with all our COPD patients, up to 25 liters per minute. We use 100% oxygen. Nobody's ever stopped breathing. And if they do, we go, hey, take a breath. It's, it's, it's an unrealistic fear, in my opinion. And certainly with the ILD patients, don't worry about it. Blow it out. You need it. You need the oxygen. Um, Next question. Uh, I've got a question. Who's that? Uh, this is Bruce. Yep. Uh, looking for information on a cannula maximizer, oxygen maximizer, that has a pendulum. Have you heard of those? And tell me yep. about them. Yep, there, it's called an oximizer. There's two. There's two versions. One one is the mustache type, and then there is the pendant type. So, <clears throat> the, those cannulas are made by. It was Chad, and I think Drive has them now. So I think it's the Drive oximizer. Um, and most people like the pendant because the mu the mustache one is pretty big. You see the mustache ones more in the hospital. Um, but what those do is those pendants, or your, the mustache, they, when you run continuous flow through them, uh, that pendant or that mustache holds a little extra volume. So kind of when you breathe in, it gives you that, that extra volume. So, you know, it's good for people that are kind of at the two or three liter a minute continuous flow uh, settings because it can allow you to drop it down to even one. Uh, because that, that extra volume that's in, in that oximizer pendant or mustache is enough, uh, you know, enough to, to allow you to get enough oxygen that you can have the flow setting lower. Um, but the higher the setting, the higher you go, the less, the less effective those are. So if you're at eight liters a minute, uh, you might not see the, the ability to reduce your flow setting as much as you would if you were at a two or three. And I'll, I'll try and explain... The, the reason why here at two liters a minute, roughly on every breath, you get about 33 milliliters of oxygen when you breathe in. The pendant holds about 20. So when you breathe in at two liters a minute, you're getting about 55, uh, 55 milliliters when you combine the two liters a minute plus the oxygen that is in, in the pendant or the mustache. So that 20, that 20 milliliters is a pretty big percentage of that total 55, roughly 40%. Um, but when you get up to eight liters a minute, you know, you're around 120 mils per breath when you breathe in. And that extra 20 that's provided, uh, you know, brings you up to 140 or so. Um, and this is just kind of math I'm doing in my head. So, uh, so that 20% or that, that 20 milliliters, when you add it to that 120 that you're breathing at eight liters, that doesn't have as, as much of an impact as it does at that lower flow setting where that, that extra volume is a, 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 a lot bigger percentage of the total volume that you're breathing in. For, for those of you that don't, don't know, Ryan is, is wearing the mustache today. I'm wearing the pendant. <laughs> um, so here's another question. And, well, one other thing I do want to mention about those, the, the cannula nares on those are a little bit wider. Um, so, you know, they're not kind of your standard cannula uh, uh, width. They are wider. So some people, and, and especially the part that goes around here, those are a little wider. Um, and another thing is you can't use pulse devices on those. 
because of that extra volume and the extra volume is in it, that's in here, uh, the sensitivity of, of some of those pulse devices out there, it might not be able to pick up your in inspiration as quickly as it would on a normal cannula. So if you're, if you're breathing on a pulse device with one of those oximizer cannulas, uh, it might sense it a little bit later. So you might not get that total volume of oxygen that you're supposed to get from a pulse device. So the optimizer should only be used with continuous flow and know that, you know, the cannulas are typically a little bit wider. Bruce, does that, does that answer your question there? I cannot unmute. Uh, yes, it does. Okay, great. Um, another. I have a question. Who's that? Laureen. Yes, Laureen. And like, like Kathy, I had the overnight uh, sleep with a, some kind of a computerized watch on okay. with the, and the thing on my finger. And that was for seven hours. And of two of those hours, my oxygen went between 68 and 75 during the night. But it was not mentioned that I needed to have a sleep study for that. But I do have a question about the oxygen levels. When I go to bed, Before you go I'll on, check. What do you think of that? Uh, I mean, to me, it's like, my, my thought is the same. It's like, I'm surprised. So what she had is, is most likely a wrist ox. So she has the fingertip probe, and it's just you know, something that attaches to what looks like a wrist watch. So it tracks your heart rate and your oxygenation, um, you know, and it can be a good indicator of, you know, if, if something's going on at night. Um, I don't know what, you know, your, your condition is, um, but, you know, wh whenever I see that, you know, a DSAT during the night, my first thought is, you know, is there some sort of apnea or even hypopneas or whatever, you know, my thought kind of goes to your, your, your sleep quality. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe there's something out there, you know, that, you know, whatever you're being tested on that that's not needed. They don't have a reason to think that. I don't know, you know, sometimes people do what's called the Epworth sleepiness scale, uh, which is kind of, you know, you kind of track how, how well you think you're sleeping. Um, and then, you know, if you said that, you know, you were feeling fine, you don't have any daytime sleepiness, you know, maybe they, you know, they thought that was good enough to, to rule out, you know, testing further for, for sleep stuff. But whenever I hear that, my, my thought is, you know, I, I'd get one of the home sleep screeners to see if, you know, see if you can rule out, you know, uh, uh, sleep apnea. Lorraine, have you ever had a sleep study in the hospital? No. I would insist on it if I were you. And, and the reason why, and you know, I, I, I know a bit about your history. Right. Um, you're not, you wouldn't be an unusual candidate um, for sleep apnea. Okay. And just as, as compared to Kathy's situation where Kathy has, you know, ILD and, and I could, I could make the case why she would be less likely to have sleep apnea in your case. Especially, you didn't just say like you went to eighty-eight percent. You said what were your numbers? Uh, for two during uh, two hours of the night, it went from sixty-eight to seventy in between sixty-eight and seventy-five. Yeah, that's that's significant. I, I I mean, I would insist on a sleep study. And you know what? If if it turns out that, if it turns out that you do have sleep apnea and you wind up getting treated for it, it's going to help a lot of your conditions and minimize your risk. Okay, I have a I question. I have yeah. a question. Uh, is that um, is Stephanie? That nope, who's speaking? Uh, Stephanie. Stephanie. Yes. Okay. Go for it, Stephanie. OK, I had a sleep study test in a uh, clinic two nights ago. I walked in as a known pulmonary fibrosis patient and requested supplemental oxygen as I entered because I was desatted to 70. And uh, they were asking me questions about, when do you go to sleep? And I said, get me the oxygen. I can't answer your questions. They got me the oxygen, answered the question. They gave me the test. They stuffed three cannulas into my nose. The supplemental oxygen was outside of the room. I couldn't control it. I kept my oximeter so I could track my Chinese little invention here on my finger to verify during the night. 
because they told me they were going to shut the oxygen off for five minutes. And I said, whoa, I cannot take that. And they said, well, we have to establish your need. You have, you have a prescription already, correct? I, I had a CPAP machine issued 10 years ago in another state. I moved to this state. My machine crapped out a year ago, and I've been using two liters continuous flow at night until I could get back to the doctor because I'm a snowbird, okay? You, you have an oxygen prescription though, right? Not according to the insurance company. Okay. <laughs> well, I, won't, I won't go into it. What oxygen you have on? I'm on the wonderful, blessed, Inogen subpar system. Stephanie, I have yeah. you walked into the, to the place and you were at 70%. Were you on any oxygen? Just my, just the portable. And you were still at 70%. Yes. Oh, I know. If I walk, I drop like a rock. What What is your setting? What is your setting right now? Because you're you're personally breathing right now, so that tells me that you're not getting enough oxygen. Uh, I'm at uh, on the inogen. I am at uh, setting of three. I can step it up to four, which I normally is there. Is there is there a reason you 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 had it at three? Despite your, your discomfort right now and your personal breathing, is there a reason you had it at three and didn't have it higher? Are you plugged into the wall right now? No, I'm not. Okay, so you are using batteries. I, I am if I sit over there, but that's beside okay. the point. I find any setting on this Inogen. A four and five okay. are almost negligible. Yes. Three and four are the most advantageous. What is your and setting? If I'm seated, not moving, it's fantastic. And, and this is this is a this is a good time to explain why that is the case. So the Inogen, all of those small portable concentrators that are pulse only, the way they operate is they have they deliver you a, a fixed minute volume. So at two, three, four, five, whatever your setting is, you get that volume. So at three, it's giving you about six hundred and sixty milliliters of oxygen per minute. And that's no matter how fast you're breathing. So the slower you breathe, the more oxygen you get. The faster you breathe, which is when you get up and start walking around and doing stuff, it actually gives you less volume. You get the same volume over the course of a minute. But when you start getting up and moving, you need more than that oxygen is giving you at, at that setting of three. So in that case, when you get up and start walking around, you know, the setting should be increased, you know, to four or five. You know, I understand you just said the five really isn't, you know, isn't, it isn't working for you. And, you know, lots of people, lots of people say that. It's like, you know, we have, you know, I've tried doing this and it's just, it's just not comfortable for me. Sometimes the peak flows are, are too high. It dries people's nose out. So, yep, that all, I mean, that all makes sense to me. Um, but right now what this is saying to me is this is, you know, and you seem you seem to understand that that you know this isn't necessarily an appropriate device for you to be using right now because it is not meeting your needs, um, right. and especially since you are you know I can see you on here your your purse lip breathing you know you're short of breath and you know trying to get comfortable um, and that you know that's that's really difficult um, you know my my recommendation is is when you are active if you can tolerate it at all turn it up to as high a setting as you can. You know, unfortunately, that's going to mean you go through the battery faster, um, you know, and those are some of the adaptations or whatever that people are asked to make all the time. And, you know, it's, it's not ideal by any means. Stephanie, okay. what machine do you have? I have the Inogen uh, Pulse, uh, the portable Inogen, uh, Inogen 1G3. The G3. So using Ryan's chart, okay, and doing math here, okay, the Inogen G3 at a maximum of, if you're breathing 30 breaths per minute, okay, the maximum liter flow or the maximum amount of oxygen you're getting is 33 milliliters per, per breath, okay, which equals 990 milliliters. And this is why I call portable oxygen concentrators the greatest hoax in healthcare because even at the peak, 
Stephanie. You're getting less than one liter per minute continuous. Exactly. And that's, that's, at the five, that's at the five setting. So you'll see people out there saying, well, I have it to five. That's five liters a minute. No, 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 no. That is not five liters a minute. If you're on a pulse setting, it's just a number. Getting back to the sleep test. Yes, sorry. Okay. We were horrified by the first minute. Sorry. Yes. And then they told me, you know, they were going to shut it off for five minutes. And I said, don't. Because I said, I need oxygen. So then I go in for this test. I did not sleep. I'm probably going to have to repeat it. Uh, I, I was totally aghast at the whole thing. They stuffed three cannulas into my nose. Wow. And I'm supposed because the one had the oxygen in it, and the other two were to take other measurements during the sleep test to determine what they were going to replace my old CPAP machine with. Because I'm in another state, they want to give me a whole new machine course. I, I left mine in my other house. So I have to get a new machine. And they didn't even get around to testing me for that. I explained it to the doctor. But I'm in with a technician now. I'm, I'm going to suggest, if possible, you see if you can go to somewhere else, a different sleep. Line. I don't have a choice. Okay, okay. One clinic services the whole Rio Grande Valley. All right, all right. Are you saying that you don't have an, that you don't qualify for an oxy oxygen prescription? Um, I got the doctor to write a prescription for liquid oxygen, okay. and I have been. That was on the 12th of February, and I'm still sitting here with nothing, not even gaseous, at yeah. this point. Because they tell me no one in the Rio Grande Valley provides it. I found a provider. And now they're saying, but you have to talk to them. You can't include insurance. You can't include the doctor. You can't include WellMed, the subcontractor on the insurance. Nobody else is going to be in the loop. It's just going to be you and them and the prescription has been faxed to them, but it's like nobody wants to be associated with it at all. My husband says it's like it's a black market. It is. I would strongly suggest you ask if there's a patient advocate in the area, or I would even consider consulting a senior care lawyer um, to help you with this because I mean, you, you know, as Ryan said, we see you're in distress right now. What's your oxygen saturation right now? You're definitely on, gonna, what? On my Chinese oxygen. It's okay, you're sitting, yeah. If you're a Republican, it's called China, not China, sorry. I, I usually don't go for political jokes, but. Oh, I love them. <laughs> okay, my uh, SAT is 91 pulse. 63. Yeah. You're on the super low end of okay. You definitely qualify for oxygen. And yeah. I see that it says Stephanie F's iPad. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. If I go someplace and my oxygen 70% and no one's paying attention to me and giving me any, any oxygen, I'm going to get the Stephanie F out of there. Okay? No joke. <laughs> like, seriously. Like, that is – you have to treat somebody. It's like sometimes people come off our elevator – and we see immediately they're in distress. We could see it. They roll off the elevator in distress. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to get a mask and we're going to oxygenate them at 100% oxygen just to get them out, out of the deep water. You know what I mean? It's like, get you on shore. We'll deal with everything else after that. And, yep. Stephanie, you know, I'm, I'm happy to help you with this because something's not going right there. But I think we have to find out a way we have to put a little pressure on um even kiddos mad she's she's barking her up a storm but we have to find a way to put some pressure on the local people there and make it a liability issue because you need oxygen there's no question about it we'll talk i see, about my, doctor. I see my doctor monday yeah and 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 tell him what ryan said not me no i'm just kidding you could tell him <laughs> i'm just kidding you could listen i stand by that a thousand percent but, you know, Ryan's the wrestling expert. So, all right, next, anyone have another question before I go to the, the chat questions? I have, I have seen the six-minute walk change since 1995. 
used to walk six minutes without stopping, and the most recent, they stopped every minute and took a reading. Ryan, any, any feelings on that? I mean, that, you know, like I said earlier, like, it seems like, you know, every facility or whatever, every situation seems to be different, either depending on who's doing it or whatever, you know, whatever their protocol might be. Um, you know, I wouldn't think you should be stopping. You know, if you, if you need to stop to take a reading, my guessing is, you know, they're feeling that the equipment isn't capable of tracking appropriately. So you need to stop and, you know, make sure that, you know, you're not moving and there's no artifact or whatever so they can get an accurate reading. But as soon as you stop, you know, you're kind of defeating the purpose. So if you're stopping every minute for six minutes, you know, you're not really exercising. You know, that's not really, uh, you know, that's not really testing uh, your, your activity level and how your oxygen, your blood oxygen is responding to that. Agree a thousand percent. I mean, and again, that's that you're, when you're stopping, you're giving your body a chance to, to catch up. It totally defeats the purpose. Um, you know, what we do, we have people on telemetry. So we are looking at your heart rate and rhythm the entire test. The patient is carrying the oximeter and in minute intervals, you know, we're walking with you. We're just looking at the oximeter. I mean, you shouldn't be stopping at that point. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a useless test in my opinion, I will state that I think it's got very little value when done perfectly correctly. When it's done incorrectly like that, it's just about useless. It's like you want to know how a plane is when it flies. You can't test it on the runway. Other questions. My SATs are usually at 99 when I wake up and I use it an NIV and at night. My settings are two liters per rest at, per liters at rest and three liters when active. It will go down to 95 to 98, but doctor says getting to 99 or 100 is not a problem. I have been this way for years. Yeah, do you, do you think that's a problem, Ryan? No. Agree. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't sound like it to me. Ryan, can you just take a minute, talk about the difference between, because we talked about Lorene and Kathy. So for somebody that's desaturating at night due to, let's say, interstitial lung disease versus somebody who's got sleep apnea. What's the difference between supplemental oxygen and, and, and a positive assist, like a CPAP or a BiPAP? Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, somebody, you know, whoever on ILD that's not using CPAP, you know, the idea is that, you know, with ILD, you have the scarring in the lungs. So, you know, you have impaired gas exchange because your, your lungs are damaged. With CPAP, you know, that opens, that opens the airways. So you, you put pressure in the lungs and it opens the airways, especially some in the lower lungs, you know, that might be, uh, you know, collapsed or just not, not effectively ventilating. For somebody with ILD, you know, the, the, the scarring, you know, is going to prevent that anyway. So, you know, the pressure isn't necessarily going to, going to help that, where in somebody who might have COPD and there's gas trapping, opening some of those airways uh, you know, is going to facilitate some more of that gas exchange. So there's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be a, a better chance of uh, improving that gas exchange than somebody necessarily with, with ILD. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so then, you know, adding supplemental oxygen on top of that, you know, is, is only going to help too. Ryan, how do we tell if a POC being advertised is really medical grade? If it's, if it's being advertised, you know, in the U.S. anyway, um, you know, it's already been approved by the FDA. So, you know, they, they, when, a, when a new device comes on the market or if, if there's an update or something like that, you know, they're compared to all the devices that have, have come out already. So it's going to be, you know, it's going to be considered medical grade. Um, you know, it, and I don't know, I guess, I don't know if the question is medical grade oxygen. That's, that's a little you know, that term can refer to uh, oxygen in a cylinder where that's 99.99 something percent pure. So I don't, I don't know if that's the question. No concentrator can deliver 99% oxygen. The highest they can go is about 95, 96%. Because again, they take, the, they take the room air, filter out the oxygen. They can't filter all of the trace gases out. So some of that, you know, that additional four or 5% is just, you know, the additional trace gases that are in the, uh, uh, are in the room air anyway. So it's not, you know, it's not affecting you any differently. It just means that the concentrator can't give you 99.99% oxygen. So I don't know if that, if that was kind of the reference or if it's just saying 
you know, how do we know that the quality of the device is, you know, is meeting medical standards? You know, they're, they're, if they're on the market, you know, the FDA has approved them. So they've proved some sort of equivalency to some other device that is currently out there. Um, whether it's an effective device or not, you know, uh, for you is, is another question entirely. But if it's, if it's out there, you know, it's gone through safety measures and all, all that type of stuff. So, you know, it's approved for use. Okay, can I just, I was the one who posted that question. Um, the devices that were, they came into one of the forums on Facebook and they were advertising these portable oxygen concentrators and they had a website and they were like, they were like the Inogens and the Simply Go Minis, but they were like $300. And then they had okay. like, they were like really high flow and really lightweight and... Okay, so I, I actually wrote about this in the pulmonary paper, I think within the last few months or so. And you can see some of these on Amazon where it says a portable concentrator. But what those are, um, you know, they're not, they're not the same type of portable oxygen concentrator as we understand them. Those are often Chinese made and they're not delivering that 95% oxygen. They're delivering very low purity oxygen, 20, 30, 40%. Um, so if you see any of those that have, you know, either like Chinese names or, you know, anything like that. Basically anything that is not in the chart that, that we kind of put out, you know, I, I, would, I would question it and say, you know, look into it further. Um, I don't remember what issue that was in the pulmonary paper, but I did mention that. And yeah, the price point should be, should be a big red flag. You know, if it's $300, they're just, if there aren't any portable concentrators that are meant for medical use that are $300, brand new. Anyway, you know, you're typically going to pay probably at least $1,500, you know, if not more. So, yeah, the price should be a big red flag to say, you know, all right, something's, something's off with this unit and I should not, you know, I should look into it further. But, you know, to me, that would tell me that it's probably one of those Chinese manufactured units that are delivering low flow, low purity oxygen. So they're not filtering out as much oxygen as the, you know, your Inogens and your, your Simply Go Minis and that type of thing. Okay. I think Thanks. a good rule of thumb is if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Right. I mean, that sounds, that sounds really good to be true. Um, Ryan, before we get away from sleep completely, can you use uh, pulse, pulsed oxygen during sleep? A pulse oximeter? Or, oh, pulse oxygen. Yeah. No, you should not. You should not use pulse oxygen during sleep because when, when, you're, on a C, when you're on a CPAP device, that flow is con consistently moving. So what's going to happen is if you tee into the, uh, the tubing like you would with continuous flow, the, uh, the pulse action device is looking for a signal to trigger. So it's looking for a pressure change. So with that flow constantly going through, it's basically continually pulling kind of a negative pressure away from that. So it's basically you're just gonna keep triggering and keep triggering and keep triggering. And it's not supposed to do that, it's supposed to trigger on your inhalation. So what'll happen is, you know, if it's an electronic device, it'll probably start alarming saying, you know, where it's, it's, it's delivering too much oxygen, it can't keep up. Um, so yeah, never, never use a pulse device with CPAP at night. But what about- and I, and I would say don't use a pulse device at night. People do. And I mean, I think Inogen even advertises on their website, you know, if, if you're just using it at night, you know, my issues with using just a pulse device at night is that one, your breath, your, your breath pattern gets, gets much shallower. So it may still be triggering, but it may be delivering later in inhalation. So the volume that you're supposed to get might not get all the way down into the lungs. And then you have the issue of, you know, if the cannula starts moving, you know, you start moving around, the cannula is moving and coming out of the nose. I know on the Inogen, you can shut the alarm off if you don't want to hear it. So, you know, somebody who does that, and if the cannula comes out, you know, it, it'll, it'll be blinking on the device, but you're not going to hear an audible alarm. So you're not ever sure if you're fully getting oxygen uh, at night on a pulse device. At, at the very least, with continuous flow, you know that oxygen is continually running and you don't have those issues with sensitivity and triggering uh, and that type of thing. Yeah, the cannula might come out, so you might end up in the same situation. But, you know, for a pulse device, you're not guaranteed that it's going to trigger on every breath. At least with the continuous flow oxygen, that at least you know that oxygen is, is always being delivered. So some people, you know, some people sleep on a pulse device and it's, you know, and they, they do fine on it. So, you know, I just, I personally can't recommend doing that because I just, it, it's too, 
there's too many variables there to, to, to ensure that you're getting the oxygen that you need. I feel the same way. And, and studies have come out that show that you can use pulse, pulsed oxygen at night. I, you know, it's like, the, uh, I think I, I even said this last time, but there's a, a, a segment of Bill Maher, you know, where they say, I don't have any proof. I just know it's true. I don't have any proof that it's not 100% okay. It's just for me, I just wouldn't want to chance it. And I wouldn't, yep. you know, again. And I know, I know people who do that. But they'll take their Inogen, you know, if they're traveling or whatever, they're like, I don't want to worry about having to get a stationary concentrator at, you know, at the hotel or wherever I'm staying. I'll just bring my Inogen or my portable device and, and sleep on that. And, you know, and it, it works for them. You know, at least that's what they say, you know, but that's the thing. You never, you never really know, you know, if it, if it is truly working unless you're, you're somehow monitoring it. And even if you do, you know, some people will have a sleep study with their pulse device. And I'll show, you know, they oxygenated pretty well at night. Well, what about the next night? You know, it's not guaranteed you're going to have the same experience the next night. So just like I said, kind of with, with the variables that exist in delivery, you know, I have a hard time feeling comfortable recommending using a pulse delivery system uh, at night with sleep. Agree. And, you know, like with most things, you know, this is why you can't also, I, I use the word sleep now, but not in the same way. You can't get too comfortable knowing your numbers. That's why we monitor people every session and many times during the session. It's like you're only as good, like, a, you know, a plane is only as good as its last flight. And everything works until it doesn't work. So it's like, to me, that's why you have to keep checking these things. Like if we, if we could get your heart rate and get your blood pressure and get your oxygen and it, it never changed, there would be no reason for measurements. Next question. Um, my portable B tank regulator pulses oxygen even when I don't breathe in. Hey, hey, sorry guys. My portable B tank regulator pulses oxygen even when I don't breathe in. I have gotten a few different regulators and they all do this. I don't remember this happening years ago. It has just started about eight months ago. So this is a pulse regulator. Did it say that? Or just a portable right. regulator? Uh, pulses oxygen. Vicky, I'm going to guess that you, you're, you're saying that you have a, a pulsed regulator. And even if you don't trigger the breath, the breath is being triggered. Is that correct? And I'd, li I'd like to know if this is an electronic or a uh, pneumatic, which is just kind of a medical or a metal device. Um, it's a B tank. Okay. What? And yeah, it's, it's a B tank. What? What's the regulator on there? Just the regulators that go on top of those green tanks. Yep. That's it's not um it's not electric. It's not electric. So no, is it? no, it's just a regular oxygen tank that you carry around in a bag. Yep. And um. And so where you connect where you connect your cannula. That's, that's the regulator. So can you tell me what, what the regulator is? Or what, do you have it by you, by chance? Yeah, can you grab it for me, honey? Yeah, my husband will get it for me. Um, I've gotten a few different ones, and they even pulse unless I hold it a certain way, and, you know. <laughs> Yours does the same thing? Okay, so... <clears throat> You tell you um, to step it up a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, so, to, I mean, to me, what that says. Yeah, to me, to me, what that says is there's something, you know, there's something wrong with it. That you know, the, the valve in there is either malfunctioning or, um, you know, it's either set way too sensitive. Um, you know, obviously, it shouldn't be doing that. So, if, if that's that's Okay, so that's that's called an easy valve. It does it on yours too. Do you have that same one, the easy pulse? Yeah. Okay. So here we have an example of two people having the same problem on the same device. So I, it makes me wonder how many others out there are, are having that. So there's a valve in there in that device that is kind of waiting for you to pull for a breath. And if that valve is defective, um, I could see why it would start kind of auto triggering for, for lack of a better term. I would say you would want to replace that. And, you know, you said that, you know, you've done that. I don't know if they've replaced it with the same device, 
I'm not sure how old that, that Easy Pulse, those Easy Pulse uh, uh, conserving regulators, they've been around for a long time. So that could be a very old, old device. And I would say, do you have a new one that I could you know? Are there batteries in there? There's batteries in those, uh, in the Pulse devices, there are batteries in there that have to be changed every so many months. In the Pulse uh, one I have, Yep, yep. So yeah, there are there are electric ones, and typically with those, it might be where the uh, the trigger sensitivity is too sensitive in that. You know, and you, that's not something that you can adjust on those devices. Um, if you're finding that you're having the same experience, um, you know, and it may not, you know, it may not be for everyone there. But if you're if you're having it auto trigger, you know, to me that says that it's it's a little overly sensitive, um, and you know, to, to see if maybe you could get a new one or a different one too. Because again, who knows how old that one is. I know they, you know, they bring them back and, you know, clean them up or whatever and just put them back out again. So, um, you know, it's obviously it shouldn't be auto triggering. It shouldn't be triggering more than when you breathe in. And if it's not triggering when you do breathe in, it's not, if it's not triggering enough, that tells me it's not, it's not as sensitive. So you may need to get another, you know, another, another device that is sensitive enough. Uh, you know, from our testing, those easy pulses haven't always been very sensitive. It takes a lot to initiate a, a pulse from those. So the fact that it's, you know, pulsing more often than it should is kind of, uh, you know, interesting to me in that, you know, that's not usually what I see. Usually I see it's not sensitive enough. So that's why I'm kind of thinking, you know, something, there, there's some issue with one of the, one of the valves in there that is, that is causing it to, to continually trigger. And sometimes you get a bad batch, you know what I mean? And yeah, and yeah it happens. Not sharp, but I think I would try, especially since she's had multiples. Ryan, is it possible there's something wrong with the tank? Uh, you would have different tanks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, try it on a different tank. You know that that would kind of be one way to one way to check. I mean, I guess it. it you know, anything is possible, I guess. But I I would tend to think that it's something with the device. You know, unless you have tried multiples of that device on that tank and haven't tried another tank, then I would see, you know, maybe there's something with a connection on the tank uh, that is causing, you know, causing the issue. So try it on another tank as well. Next if, question. If possible. George has liquid oxygen and we, we, we get a weekly delivery, not yet on Medicare. Okay, so you're lucky, still, still private insurance. Some of the privates will pay for it. They pay better rates. So Yep, yep. And that's, you know, you'll see that often. If you have supplementary or, you know, just kind of your own and you're not, you're not affiliated with Medicare, uh, you know, there's probably a better chance that you will be able to get liquid. But oftentimes you'll see, you know, the insurance companies will follow what Medicare is doing too. So, you know, they may, you know, they may reduce their payments and, and, and benefits for that. So, um, you know, it, it's worth following. But yeah, typically the people you know, that still have liquid or do have liquid, you know, usually have at, at the least a supplemental, if not, you know, are not on Medicare at all. Um, Paulie is making a comment, I believe, in response to Bruce Anderson's uh, question before. He said he bought one of the pendant type and it was awful. He's on Medicare and gets liquid. Um, you know, I think also with some of these devices, the key to, to realize is that the more your requirement is, the less you can expect those things to really make a difference. You know, if you need six liters or eight liters, there's only so much that's going to do. Um, I have COPD. How do I know if I retain CO2? Uh, so that, you know, that will usually come if you go in, you'll have a, a blood gas, you know, taken and it'll tell you, you know, the, the results will show that, you know, you have a higher, uh, higher CO2 content in your blood, which is, you know, typical of a COPD patient. So I don't know that that's something that you can just do at home. Uh, if there's, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any sort of home, home method of, of testing if you're a retainer or not. It usually comes out of a, a, a blood gas, and that's something that you have to get in the clinic or, or hospital. Um, so, you know, chances are, if you are, you know, if you are COPD, you are going to be a retainer. And what happens is your, your body's metabolism kind of compensates for that. So, um, you know, you'll have more CO2 in your blood, which is why your kind of blood oxygen content goes down and it is not quite the percentage that it is, uh, you know, for, for healthy. That's, that's an arterial blood gas, not a metabolic panel. The metabolic panel CO2 
when we test bicarbonate. Right, but an ABG, an arterial blood gas, yes. Um, here, here's another question. Um, sorry. Is the CO2 registering on the oximeter as O2 or a mix of both showing a deceptive reading? What was the question? Is, I think what she's asking is, 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 does the CO2, is the oxygen saturation that you're seeing, and Jan, if I'm reading it wrong, please tell me, but I think the question is, um, is, the C, is the oxygen reading a combination of CO2 and O2? No, no. And it's, it's separate. You know, I think what you might be thinking of is carbon monoxide, because carbon monoxide sometimes can register and, and make the, the um, you know, people get confused between MCO, which is carbon monoxide, which is a odorless, colorless gas, you know, and CO2, which is carbon dioxide. CO is what you have to measure for, um, you know, and have that meter for, but it, it, that will interfere with your oxygen saturation readings, not CO2, separate. Right. If you had, you know, if you were in an event where you had smoke inhalation or whatever, exactly. um, you know, they, they typically wouldn't use a pulse oximeter or pulse oximetry at all. Uh, you'd use a more sophisticated device that can kind of separate between what, what, what hemoglobins and oxygen are attached to. So it'd be a little more advanced there. Exactly. Uh, Ryan, I've heard you're not supposed to use products like, this is a great question. I've heard you're not supposed to use products like VIX while on oxygen. VIX that, and any other petroleum based, is that okay? Yeah, it is, it is not okay. I mean, people do it, but they are putting themselves at risk if they come into contact with flame. That's, that's the idea behind that. So if you're using a petroleum product like VIX VapoRub or any of that stuff that has kind of oils in it, you know, if you, were to, if you had your oxygen in and you had your VIX VapoRub here and, you know, so, say you were cooking something over, you know, over a fire and the fire ignite, you know, the oxygen helped, uh, uh, you know, ignite even bigger flames in front of you, um, you know, and then you have this oil stuff on your face, um, you know, that's, that's the idea behind it. You're, you're putting yourself at risk. I know people still do it because it, it makes them comfortable, but just know that if you are, uh, you're, you're, you're putting yourself at risk. And don't blow out birthday candles. Yes. Yes. Very good. How, how, how scared should people be about cooking while wearing oxygen? Well, if there's open flame, I mean, you, you certainly shouldn't be doing that. You know, if you have an electrical stove or whatever, you shouldn't have an issue. Um, you know, if you have a gas stove that, you know, has flames on it, then, you know, I wouldn't have oxygen anywhere near that. Okay. Um, next question. Why are the prices so high for the portables? Is it only because they can get away with charging whatever they want because people are desperate? That sounds about right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say that's not inaccurate by any means. Um, you know, <clears throat> the, the prices have come down a little bit, especially on, you know, the indigens have been out for a long time. You know, the, the longer the product's been out when care, Care makes the Eclipse and the Eclipse 5, and then they brought out the, uh, what they called the Equinox, which was essentially the, the, same, the same product in a smaller, you know, slightly smaller, uh, smaller device, but it was almost two times as expensive. And, you know, the idea there, I think, was that, you know, they put a bunch of development in it, you know, and they needed to recoup their costs for development and, uh, uh, you know, being able to sell it. So... But guess what? The Equinox is gone already. So they priced, you know, basically they priced it too high and nobody bought it. So now they're not even supporting that anymore. They just still have the Eclipse, you know, which is, you know, probably you can find around two to two to three thousand dollars, twenty five hundred bucks. Um, yeah, they are expensive. You know, you can get a stationary concentrator for, you know, five hundred bucks, you know, five hundred, eight hundred dollars. And, you know, those have been around for a long, long time and the technology really hasn't changed. So when, once you start getting into that uh, need to reduce size and improve battery life and all that type of stuff, you know, you're, you're starting to get higher costs of production. Um, so that, you know, justifies uh, some of the, the higher costs associated with that. But yeah, you know, they're, they're in it to make money too. So they're gonna price it one competitively 
with you know other things that are out there and it's, it's not really a concern for them um, whether whether or not that's good you know a good price for the patient it's you know can we can we still make money on this it's like drug prices although they're yep. Big Pharma's on the hot seat this week in the Senate. So hopefully we'll see some changes. Um, Ryan, does a pulse device deliver liters per minute when, on a, when an on-demand regulator, when it's on an e-tank? So does like a pulse regulator, I'm guessing, give liters per minute or is it still setting? No. So, I mean, that, that's one of the big messages that we try and send out and have people take away. Any pulse setting should never be equivalent to a, a liter flow setting, okay? So we, we like to say a two is not a two is not a two. If you have three pulse devices in front of you, none of those set at two are two liters a minute, and each of those probably has a different pulse volume associated with it. So none of them are equivalent to each other, and they're most certainly not equivalent to two liters a minute. So if you hear, you know, if you hear somebody say, you know, like, like that easy pulse that we saw just, just a few minutes ago. That has five pulse settings. And it also has a continuous flow setting of two liters a minute. There's an there's a LPM setting on there that says two liters a minute. And that's kind of its you know, uh, you know, backup flow rate or whatever. But you know, it has five pulse settings. None of those should ever be referred to as five liters a minute or four liters a minute, three, two liters a minute. It's a one, two, three, four, five pulse setting. Same with that indigen we saw earlier. One, two, three, four, five. None of those are leader flows ever, ever. So if you hear somebody saying that, take the opportunity to say, well, no, these are actually just numbers on the dial that refer to how much this device is delivering at that setting. And it is not equivalent to a leader flow. What about M6 tanks with the regulator on them? So, you know, the, the tank really doesn't matter. It's, it's what's on the regulator that matters. So if you have a continuous flow regulator that has one, two, three, four, five, six, that means you're going to get one, two, three, four, five, six liters a minute. But if it is a pulse regulator, you know, like that easy pulse device that we saw, that means it's, it's a pulse setting. So I don't know, you know, do you, do you know, do you have a continuous flow regulator or a pulse regulator? It does both. I can get two or four continuous, two or four continuous, or one through six pulse. Okay. Is that a is that a bonsai? Does it say bonsai on there? Yeah, it's a bonsai. Okay. So yep. So that that is a pulse regulator that has two continuous flow settings of two and four liters a minute. But that one, two, three, four, five, six, those are pulse settings and should never be referred to as liter flow settings. Only that two and four liter per minute should be referred to as leader flow settings. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, I, I just posted the link to the most recent pulmonary paper in which Ryan writes about each device. So look for your own device there and it will tell you what is able to be delivered on the different settings. And it, it will blow your mind in, in many cases because you think you're getting a certain amount. But the, the best way to do it is when you look at you know, the, the dose volumes per breath, or you look at the maximum delivered pulse. So if it's 15 breaths per minute, and it's 22 milliliters per breath, you multiply those two. And remember, a 1000 milliliters is a liter. So that will give you some some great info. Um, what, he's, what he's sending just covers the portable concentrators. though. we don't that doesn't have like the bonsai or the easy pulse that we just talked about. Right. Uh, that doesn't have that information on there, unfortunately. Um, but may, may, that's actually a good idea. Maybe I should cover some of those uh, some of those pulse regulators that are that are pretty common out here because they do. You know, the two on that easy pulse is not going to deliver the same as a two on that bonsai device. So those those pulse volumes at those settings will be different. Mendo, Mendo, do you want to ask your question of Ryan about your uh, float device? Yeah. I just was wondering if you were familiar with these. I have it between my cannula and my main cell. And it's just a remote float valve so I can adjust to higher when I get up and lower when I sit down. Sure. So is that, so what do you, what do you have your concentrator set to right now? All the way up. 
All the way up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty typical. So that's, you know, and I know there are some, you know, some cannulas have like something very similar to that, you know, in, in the tubing right there that you can kind of adjust the flow. That's actually pretty, uh, uh, pretty ingenuous. Uh, a, a pretty good, uh, pretty good idea, and a pretty good uh, system that you got going there. Um, you know, that's that that's pretty genius. So we like to say, you know, a lot of times, you know, I can sit here and you know and talk about all this stuff. You guys come up with some pretty amazing things, you know, to uh, to help treat yourself. That's that's a pretty good idea. Um, I'm I'm really impressed. Ryan, in response to the question before about the, the, the device um, kind of triggering too, too quickly, um, somebody posted, Betty posted that Inogen indicates that their newer pulse devices deliver oxygen if it doesn't sense an inhalation. Is that a, I was thinking about that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, some of them, <clears throat> Inogen does do that. So if you are wearing it at night, um, you know, it, it will have a, a backup pulse rate. Um, and it could vary, you know, depending on what the device is, it could vary from 12 breaths a minute up to 20 breaths a minute. I think the Inogen is 17, um, if, if I remember right. So if it doesn't pick up a breath after a certain amount of time, uh, it, will, it will start auto-pulsing. So thank you for bringing that up. That is, that is correct. Uh, not all of the portable concentrators do that. I know the Simply Go has a backup pulse on there. Um, if you're on a eclipse, I think it waits 15 seconds, uh, for a breath and then it'll switch to continuous flow for, I want to say like two minutes then it'll switch back. So each of the concentrators kind of has a different method of addressing, addressing, not picking up a breath. Um, so the pulse ones, obviously only they can pulse. So they'll pulse at a certain rate, whether that's 12, 17 or, or 20. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head which one is which, but I think Inogen is 17. The other thing to keep in mind is that if it's not sensing a breath, why is that? You know, and, and that goes back to the apnea question. I mean, I would yep. be concerned that you're not triggering it. You know, yeah, it, it's great that it's going to be giving you some oxygen if, you, if it doesn't sense a breath. But if you're not taking the breath, you're not going to get the benefit of that oxygen. That's, that's a bigger concern there. So on you know on on any device that's electric, they pr they have pretty good pressure transducers that can tra track your breathing, and you can get you know often you can get pretty shallow with it still triggering. But the issue might be because that breath is shallower, you know instead of picking up your breath right when you start it, it might be you know two hundred or three hundred milliseconds later, but that might be enough time for it not to actually reach your lungs and the volume that is delivered, you know, only stays in kind of your upper airways or your, your, your larger, uh, your larger airways in your lung and doesn't actually get down into the bowels of your lungs uh, to, to be able to help with gas exchange. So, um, you know, that's kind of the issue with that, with that sensitivity, the shallower you breathe, the likelier it is that it's going to be delivered late in your later in your inhalation and that pulse volume might not reach it. So it may, it may still trigger, you know, at a at a at a, a lower rate and shallower breath, but it might not be an effective uh, uh, effective oxygen delivery. Ryan, if you could give us six more minutes, we could go to the speed round. Um, just a few things that we we wanted to talk about. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the length of tubing and 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 how important that is or unimportant? Sure. Um, you know, if you're on a continuous flow device on, on your concentrators, you know, 50, 50 feet of tubing is, is fairly common for a lot of people. Um, you may even be able to go up to 100 feet of tubing. Uh, the issue with pulse devices is that the longer your tubing gets, we get into that talk of, of, of triggering sensitivity. The longer that tubing gets, the longer that negative pressure signal takes to get to the device. So, uh, you know, I know, I believe the Inogen says you can put up to 25 on there, so, uh, and it will still effectively trigger, and their, their triggering sensitivity is pretty good, so I, I don't really question that necessarily, but, you know, my recommendation is, it will say in the manual whether or not they recommend, on a pulse device anyway, a pulse uh, portable concentrator, a pulse portable concentrator, it will say in there what, what their recommended tubing length is. Some of them do say 25. I don't know if any of them go up to 50. Um, so that, you know, 
if you do that, you know, you're kind of, you're, 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 you're at risk of not being able to appropriately trigger the device. Um, I mean, that sounds scary. That sounds shocking that even on 25 feet that it could even sense a breath. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, you know, some of this, some of the sensitivity, uh, uh technology is pretty good. Um, so it, you know, it can be done, but I, I certainly wouldn't recommend on a pulse device doing more than, you know, seven or 10 feet, 10 feet at the most. Um, if you have that, but what, what's the word on OxyView glasses? Uh, if you could tolerate them, you know, there's, there's really nothing wrong with them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a pulse, you know, similar to the, the Oximizer, you know, I wouldn't use a pulse device on there. They do have kind of narrower, uh, tubes. Um, but you know, if you don't like the cannula kind of in front of your face, uh, you know, the OxyView glasses, you know, people have had success with, especially, you know, continuous flow or whatever. There is a little bit more restriction there. So you may want to, you know, make sure that you're getting the flow rate you should, but you know, if you're on a stationary concentrator and you put it on and you see the ball drop, you know, like a liter, you may need to adjust to, to make up for that restriction that is in those uh, kind of nares that come, come around the nose. So I know people that have the OxyView glasses and they, they like them. So no downside, right? Uh, no, not really. I mean, it's just, it's just another kind of delivery or uh, you know, delivery apparatus, I guess, um, that, you know, it'll work for some people, it'll not work for others. You know, I'm not sure, you know, I think the cost for the frames is, is, is kind of high, um, but, you know, I, I've seen it work for people, so I really don't have a problem recommending them, providing, you know, you understand that, you know, you may need to, you know, kind of adjust your flow setting, because they are, they tend to be a little more restrictive, because what, the cannula will come up to your back and then go into into the frames around your ears. So uh, the, the tubing in there is, is typically less, it has a less diameter than what you see in a standard cannula tubing. So there is some more restriction through there. Um, but, you know, typically the, the concentrators and stuff uh, do have enough uh, pressure, you know, pressure to, to overcome that. You just may need to adjust your, uh, your flow dial a little bit. And then last question, transtracheal oxygen. Sure. Um, so the, the idea behind that is, <clears throat> so they'll put a stoma in a, a tube that kind of goes down to right where your lungs split. And the idea of that is that it eliminates all of this dead space in your upper airway in your nose. So when you have a cannula in your nose and the oxygen is coming in, it has to travel through your nose and then down your, down your trachea and then into the, the larger airways and then get into the smaller airways. What the, what the transtracheal does is it puts that delivery point, you know, down in the middle of your chest, basically. So right, right kind of where your lungs split, just above that. So the oxygen is avoiding all that dead space. So the benefits that people have seen from that, you know, in addition to not having to wear a cannula on your face, is that if you were on a four or five liter minute continuous flow, eliminating this amount of dead space allows them to reduce their flow setting to two or three. You know, if they're at a three, it might even allow them to reduce it to one. You know, and you, and you can use pulse on that, you know, on those devices. Uh, but typically you see it with continuous flow. Uh, and, you know, it does help allow you to reduce uh, the flow setting that you have. So for people that are using a tank and out, you know, going out and about with continuous flow, having that, that setting be able to be lower obviously increases the amount of time that they're out because they're not going through their gas tank you know, the amount of gas in their tank as quickly as they would be if they were at a three or four. Of the people that you know who've had transtracheal oxygen, are, are, are more of them satisfied or, or generally? Yeah, yeah, like by, by all accounts, I haven't heard anybody have a negative thing to say about it. People have ended up having to have them taken out, but that's, you know, for other, other conditions, um, you know, not anything to do with the, the difficulty of, of, of inserting, you know, obviously, you know, it involves a surgery. So, you know, not everybody might be able to get it. Um, but, you know, if it's something that you think would benefit you, you know, it's certainly worth, worth asking about. But, you know, it is a surgery. There's going to be a cost associated with this. So you kind of have to do your own kind of cost benefit analysis or whatever, depending on how much oxygen you're using and all that type of stuff. Consult with your, you know, doctor and all that stuff. But, um, you know, the, the people that have had it, you know, for the most part, it seems like they swear by it. So, awesome. you know, when you do, you know, there's cleaning and all that stuff associated with it, but it sounds like people get used to that pretty quickly. 
Um, I feel like we could continue talking about this for hours. Yes, I, I'd say, you know, this, this has been fascinating. It's great to actually talk to people. Um, so I am more than willing to do this, you know, in the near future as, as often as people feel well, like it's valuable. <laughs> back at two o'clock. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, I, I just want to say there, there's so much about oxygen. I mean, you know, and, and we've just covered in an hour and 45 minutes, really what's the tip of the iceberg, you know, and there's right. so many different little situations where you say, well, what if I'm walking upstairs? What if I'm doing this? Um, that I would love to talk more about. Um, and I'm happy to, um, I, I see one more question I'm going to take from Kathy in a minute. Um, but, you know, on, on Wednesday next week, I am, and no pressure, Ryan, at all, um, but I will talk a little bit more about oxygen and how to maximize your breath during activity and during different, you know, challenges that you may have, because it's a fascinating topic and it's also a topic that there's so much confusion about. Um, so, you know, so few people really, I mean, you could see Ryan is the guru. There's a reason why I call him O2 guru. Um, and it's not just cause he likes, uh, Star Wars. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's the idea that, by the way, I just thought of that one. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, there's so few people that unless you use these devices on a regular basis, you can't really instruct people on it in mm -hmm. other than a, a theoretical way, you know, and, and we know Ryan's used them all. Um, so Ryan, I, I thank you so much for being here. I hope we can commit to doing this at least every two years, if not more. Um, and let's, I will, let's, try, let's try more often. It let's try like every six months at least. And I will <laughs> unmute everybody. Thank you. 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 Have a great weekend. For those of you still in, in days 1 to 42, keep on pushing. For those of you on maintenance, don't get sloppy. Don't sleep on it, okay? Uh, exercising. We're going to have new content up tomorrow night at midnight. Have a great week, everybody. You too, man. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I'm great. So good. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank Maureen, you. I'm jealous of your background. What? Jealous of your background. Oh, yeah. Don't you like my palm trees and my <laughs> sunny <laughs> sky? <laughs> Texas. Uh, 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 yeah, especially I, since I'm looking at it snow. I don't think, I don't think ours is working. Uh, I'm looking at a foot of snow. We just got three or four more inches yesterday. Oh, uh, no. Snowiest snow. Snow, snow yeah, we got it, too. Yesterday.